My name is Carla Rautenberg, and I want to welcome you to our Move to Amend Network 2021 statewide gathering. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope. Good. Um, if not, would they answer? <laughs> okay. Um, while people are still signing in and getting settled, uh, most of you are muted, so you already know the, the drill. And um, obviously, if you are called upon to speak, then you need to unmute yourself. Um, the program is being recorded. You'll be able to type questions into the chat. And when we get to the Q&A, you can also use the raise your hand feature of Zoom to be called upon. Mary Sue, can you review how people find that raise your hand feature? Well, Carla, I said I would, and I saw it earlier, and now it has disappeared. Uh, usually, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, you can wave. We'll be watching. It's not like there's hundreds of people, so we'll look for you. But um, the chat will be easiest, or if you just want to type in the word stack so that you want to talk, but you don't want to type everything in, just type in the word stack and I'll, I'll put you on the list that way too. Right, okay. Um, so for the sake of newcomers, any newcomers who move to amend, we've asked coordinating committee member, Sandy Bolsinius to provide a brief or introduction to the organization and our work at the local, state and national levels. Sandy? Yeah, thanks. Um, I have the honor of doing what I like doing best anyway, and that is talking about Move to Amend. So I will keep this just to a few minutes. The purpose of Move to Amend could not be more clear or urgent. We claim the, right, we claim the rights of we the people as stated in the US Constitution. And, and we assert that these rights belong exclusively to real people, not artificial entities such as corporations. In short, we demand a, a government of, by, and for the people. Our strategy is twofold. Number one is to build a genuine people's movement. In other words, one that is grassroots, local and national, while adhering to a bottom-up operation. We are welcoming to all. We are nonpartisan. And also, as a genuine people's movement, we are not for sale. We do not take corporate donations. Our second strategy is promoting the We the People Amendment. This amendment declares that corporations are not people and money is not speech. So what does that mean exactly? It means a government where people, not corporations, are in the driver's seat of our democracy. In just over 10 years, Move to Men has been incredibly successful. Nationally, Representative Pramila Jayapal introduced our We the People Amendment earlier this month. It already has 50 co-sponsors in Congress, and we expect to double that in a short period of time. The amendment has enormous local support too, with 705 and counting resolutions and ballot initiatives having passed in local communities, including 26 in Ohio. It also has passed in seven states. Meanwhile, more than 600 national organizations have endorsed the We the People Amendment. Move to, Me, Move to Men is vibrant, it's growing, and it is necessary. It's needed, it's urgent, and that's why I'm so happy to have this discussion today with two of our supporters in our local state government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, now, I want to remind everyone again, if you're not muted, to mute, but I think everyone is. And uh, we'll get to what we all gathered for today, fighting corruption in Ohio by ending the political influence of wealthy individuals and corporations in state government. It's my honor to introduce our distinguished speakers, Senator Nikki Antonio, representing the people of Ohio Senate District 23, and Representative Mike Skindell, representing the people of Ohio's House District 13. I'll just give you a brief introduction to each of them. 
State Senator Nikki Antonio is serving in her first elected term in the Ohio Senate after four terms in the Ohio House of Representatives for the 13th District. A dedicated champion of workers' rights, high quality education, local governments, equal rights for women and the LGBT community, healthcare for all and fighting the opioid crisis. Senator Antonio is also recognized as a leader who reaches across the aisle to get things done. Her Senate District 23 includes Parma, Parma Heights, Brooklyn, Brook Park, Lakewood, Middleburg Heights, Lindale, and parts of Cleveland's West Side. The first in her family to graduate from college, Antonio holds a Master of Public Administration degree and a Bachelor of Science degree in education, both from Cleveland State University. Representative Mike Skindell represents the people of District 13, Lakewood in the Ohio House. He holds a bachelor's degree from Walsh College and a law degree from the Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Representative Skindell previously served four terms in the Ohio House before moving on to serve as state senator for Ohio's 23rd district in 2010. He returned to the House in 2019, motivated to work across the aisle, ensuring children and families have access to affordable health care and live in a clean and safe environment. The Ohio Environmental Council recognized uh, Representative Skindell as its 2004 Environmental Legislator of the Year. He has also received a special award of recognition from the Ohio Primary Care Association for his advocacy for Ohio's community health centers and the 2007 Legislator of the Year Award from the Ohio Academy of Trial Lawyers, among many other honors. So I'm going to ask Senator Antonio to address our topic first, and then we will hear from Representative Skindell. Each will have up to 15 minutes to speak. Then we will open up the discussion for Q&A. Senator Antonio. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me, uh, for inviting me to this discussion. And um, I, uh, before I start with my comments, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the group. Um, I see many familiar faces. We've stood together in various places in the city of Cleveland, and I know that you've all been working very hard um, across Northeast Ohio, um, some of you across the state. Uh, to make this difference so that people's voices are heard rather than uh, being, uh, rather than the public uh, decision making being made by a select few individuals with a whole lot of money, including corporations. I have, I can't start this discussion without saying, um, I'm sure like many of you, how ironic was it to hear the words of Mitch McConnell recently when he said that corporations really should stay out of the political discussion. They have no place there. That was stunning because, and I love, um, I love the fact that technology allows for some very creative uh, reporters and media folks to be able to put him screen to screen next to each other um, and show his comments of a few years ago when he told us all the corporations were people and that they had every right uh, to, to the full depth and breadth of rights as an individual um, with corporate personhood. And so I don't know of any better example of how um, out of touch um, and outrageous, not to mention dam damaging and dangerous, these kinds of policies are how dangerous corporate personhood is. And so um, as we've worked and I so much, so very much appreciate um, my uh, partner across the chamber with uh, Representative Skindall that you'll hear from in a little bit, um, the work with him has been great. We also have Kent Smith who has also been um, just a real champion of this issue 
uh, in Northeast Ohio in terms of understanding the fact that um, banning corporate personhood gives equal voice to all voters, which they, they don't have in our country right now. Right now, wealthy corporations, billionaires, super PACs um, exist to serve um, the public welfare, but not the people, not the public. And they've defined what the public welfare is. And the public welfare for them is the bottom line of dollars into their coffers uh, when all is said and done. This is a system that allows for the politicians who are supported by these, these corporate donors to be able to choose the people rather than the people choosing their representatives. Um, you know, there are studies that have been done. When people understand what this is all about, 88% of voting age Americans favor overturning Citizens United. The law at the national level, at the, the decision by the Supreme Court that made it possible for corporate personhood, in air quotes, to even exist. Um, people across the country understand that Citizens United makes it harder for their businesses to compete against larger corporations. So even small business owners understand um, that this is not good for their bottom line either. More than 66% of small business owners surveyed said, you know, they disagree with Citizens United and they would like to see it abolished as well. Rest her soul, Ruth Bader Ginsburg called Citizens United the decision the most disappointing ruling of her time on the bench. I think that's pretty stunning. You know, to think about the depth and breadth of her time on the Supreme Court and the fact that this was the issue, this was the ruling that she said because of how it affected the elections, she believed with that huge amount of money that was put into into these individual uh, campaigns from, from the result of Citizens United. I think it's pretty stunning that she believed that that was one of the most disappointing ruling of her time on the bench. And it points to the fact of how insidious it is when it comes to our elections. And we don't have to look very far to see the results of um, as they play out because of this ruling. When we equate money to speech, we've allowed this small group of extremely wealthy individuals to speak for the general public. Um, so we have introduced um, more than one time, I know there's a house uh, resolution that I'll let uh, Representative Skindal talk about. We are looking at uh, again, introducing a resolution in the Senate um, that really calls on restoring people's choice, ensuring that every vote counts. Um, it's important to note we still in the United States live in a democracy. We need to make sure that we uh, give our government back to the people, not corporations, and, and really uphold what's important um, for electing leaders and allowing for the people to make do that decision making. I mean, this falls on the tail of a long list of things that need to be remediated when it comes to election law. Um, as we see what's happening in Georgia right now, but I have to tell you, I hope um, those of you who use Twitter at all, I just posted something on Twitter yesterday. It's been, it's been floating around. Um, there is language in a bill. Uh, we don't know whether they're gonna drop it or not. My hope is they don't, um, but it's an election law that's worse than Georgia's that there, there is a group of legislators that want to bring to Ohio. And it would restrict voting rights on a number of levels. Um, what's interesting to note right now about Ohio's voting law is that it is very restrictive, even as we speak. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, the Secretary of State came into our budget hearing uh, this week. And I said, you know, we have one drop box per county uh, right now. Our counties are not the same. Um, the smallest county has less than 6,000 people in it. The larger counties have hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and 
how is that, and they're saying in Georgia that by limiting them to uh, one Dropbox per 100,000 people, that that's not fair and that's not enough. How do you rationalize, make the case for one Dropbox per, per county in, um, in Ohio? Now, I will tell you that the proposed legislation suggests that we take the drop boxes out altogether and don't give people an opportunity to actually go somewhere and drop in a mail, mail in ballot and not have to worry about whether or not it gets through the mail. So there is, um, there is so much, but at the core of the attempts to really uh, quash the vote, uh, take away the right of each person, one person, one vote, and uh, give it over to the corporations. I think at its very core, we always come back to Citizens United, to the, to the outrageous amounts of money, the, um, the fact that people are allowed to hide and not identify who the funders are. Um, the other question that we get a lot and that, and that there's always pushback on is whether or not um, money is equal to free speech. Um, the Brennan Center did an analysis of the 200, 2014 Senate races and then found outside spending more than doubled since 2010 to 486 million. And, and we know now that, that those numbers have gone through the roof. Outside groups provided 47% of total spending, more than the candidates 41% in 10 consecutive races in 2014's midterms. If we don't lift the veil over the dark money being funneled into elections and abolish corporate personhood, we have to get people to understand. I truly believe, I know all of you believe that money is not equivalent to free speech. Um, and for those of you who, and again, I know you're paying attention, I know you're on the front lines, free speech is actually at risk right now. There are legislative um, attempts going on to quash free speech in the state of Ohio, across the country. Um, we, we are really in a, uh, in a crisis mode right now. The Larry Householder corruption scandal was the largest corruption scandal in Ohio history. $65 million in bribes were funneled through a dark money organization called Generation Now. The corruption is a prime example of why we need to eliminate money in politics. And I, um, along with many Ohioans, do not understand why we are still waiting for that to go forward. Um, one can only imagine the conversations that are taking place out of the public purview in terms of, you know, why hasn't that person been removed? Why hasn't the trial gone forward? A few folks have cooperated, have pled guilty. What in the world is going on? And I don't think we have to look far to know that when there's these kinds of amounts of money involved, it makes all of us question the integrity of our system, the integrity of the people who are running it. And I don't blame anyone for questioning it because right in front of us, uh, these kinds of things are, are happening without a whole lot of resolution, or at least not a resolution that takes place very quickly. Um, the current, um, current legislation, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about current legislation, I'm gonna let uh, Representative Skindle talk about that. Um, but I just want uh, to close and then, um, We'll have time, I know, to, to answer questions. I just want to close by saying that, um, you know, sometimes this, this becomes so big. Um, I remember the first time I sat in um, a discussion, a presentation um, from Greg. Greg presented in Lakewood at the Lakewood Library. I don't know if you remember that, Greg. And it was a group of people in Lakewood. It was quite a few years ago. He had he had a, a whole um, he had a whole presentation, including some little cartoon that was running around on Capitol Hill. It was almost like there's a bill on how a bill becomes law, but um, it talked about corporate personhood, and it and it was so wonderfully instructive and really broke everything down for people because I think um, the bigness of all of these issues sometimes 
uh, makes people kind of glaze over and say, you know, with everything that's going on, with everything I'm trying to deal with in my life right now, COVID and my job and my kids and educating my kids at home and now getting them back to school, is everyone going to be safe? I know it's tough uh, to try to think about something like this, which is why, again, um, I want to thank all of you who really keep this in the forefront, this issue that keep, um, keep working on the front lines to try to make a difference when it comes to this issue of corporate personhood, this issue of uh, getting money out of politics, the, the importance of the we the people amendment, because at the end of the day, our lives on a daily basis are affected by this big issue. Because if we don't have representatives that we have been able to choose the best person to represent our voice, whether it's at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, our democracy is absolutely in jeopardy. And so this is absolutely the issue worth fighting for um, and worth maintaining and worth educating people about how it does affect us all on a daily basis. So again, I wanna thank you for inviting me here today and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Antonio. And uh, now Representative Skindell. Carla, thank you. Um, and uh, Greg, everybody. Uh, it's so good to see everybody and so many familiar faces. Uh, on here. Um, as we know that uh, uh, the move to amend the We the People Amendment movement has uh, been around now uh, going on 11 years. So we had uh, Citizen United uh, uh, decided in 2010, uh, which was a, um, uh, at the same time that was going on, we, we saw the uh, the Occupy Wall Street uh, efforts. And um, the move to amend effort uh, uh, came out of uh, uh, both of those uh, 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 things going on. Uh, and, it, it, uh, and Citizen United uh, was not a breakthrough um, decision, uh, but basically it uh, pulled together uh, decisions of the US Supreme Court that had occurred over a century, which kept on uh, um, 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 allowing uh, corporations to be persons uh, and to have all rights under the, the constitution as a natural person does. Um, and, and that poses a real problem in our uh, democratic system uh, because uh, uh, corporations uh, amass the wealth. And uh, when uh, they can then use that wealth to uh, put into the political system, um, uh, without transparency in particular um, uh, to influence that political systems, whether on issues or candidates, um, you, you take away uh, the, the democratic uh, process and, and you create more of an uh, oligarchy. And, and that's what we've been seeing here uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, Greg uh, and the move to amend uh, folks approached me, gosh, um, what was it, eight, nine, uh, 10 years ago, uh, and um, uh, we started uh, introducing uh, the move uh, to amend um, amendment in the, the House of Representatives every two years. Uh, here in um, uh, Ohio, uh, once the General Assembly is over with, we have to reintroduce it where uh, a lot of times in the US Congress, uh, that legislation can continue uh, to exist uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, Congress to Congress. Uh, and we have been uh, reintroducing it. We will be reintroducing it in the House uh, here shortly. Uh, I am going to uh, uh, re-examine the language. I, I wanna uh, work with uh, um, the move to amend folks and uh, Senator Antonio on re-examining the language just to ensure maybe we, we reference um, um, uh, HR, uh, HJ Resolution 48, which is uh, Representative J. Paul's uh, resolution on we, which is the We the People Amendment. And, and maybe we, we bring that into the fold in, in our actual resolutions um, uh, supporting um, um, uh, 
uh, uh, the effort uh, to say that uh, constitutional rights are, are the rights of natural people, not uh, uh, corporations. Um, so that, that's one thing uh, that we will be looking at. Uh, Senator Antonio represented, um, uh, had talked a, a little bit about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the House Bill 6, the first energy Larry Householder uh, scandal. And this is a prime example why we need to get um, uh, corporate money uh, and the lack of transparency uh, out of our system. Uh, so what we do know is that uh, for a number of general assemblies, uh, First Energy uh, and some other companies, uh, AEP and others, we're, we're trying to get this energy legislation passed where there would be a, a bailout of the nuclear power plants uh, uh, paid for by consumers, despite the fact that huge uh, 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 dividend payouts and profits were being made uh, and going to shareholders. Uh, and at the same time, they wanted to bail out of, of uh, several uh, coal uh, nuclear power, not nuclear, but uh, coal plants uh, down in southwestern uh, Ohio. Um, uh, actually, these coal plants uh, uh, are in Indiana, but they serve Southwestern Ohio. Uh, and this effort had been going on and, and that was also uh, tied into uh, a number of Republicans, Bill Sites down in Cincinnati, who did not like um, the, our, uh, the renewable energy portfolio standard or the energy efficiency standards. And they had been working with corporations to get rid of this, these standards and to do these um, uh, um, uh, consumer finance bailouts, uh, but they weren't going anywhere. Uh, and they had been around three or four sessions and they were unable to garner sufficient uh, votes in the, the General Assembly to do anything until uh, First Energy start funneling, as uh, uh, Senator Antonio uh, mentioned, up to $62 million uh, into, uh, um, into nonprofit corporations that were set up uh, to do electioneering uh, to uh, um, uh, elect uh, favorable uh, uh, legislative candidates uh, to the Ohio General Assembly to get Larry Householder uh, as speaker and then to usher through this legislation. Um, again, the legislation was stalled, was not moving without the intervention of that corporate money. And we did not know. We knew that some money was flowing in, but we did know, not know uh, as the legislature uh, the depth of this until uh, the federal indictment, because this money uh, remains uh, cloaked in secrecy uh, because it's being funneled into this nonprofit corporations that then funnels it into campaigns uh, and other uh, political action committees. Uh, and um, so Common Cause Ohio uh, start revealing that we, yeah, we, we know that um, uh, maybe uh, upwards to three or four million dollars was funneled, uh, but then once, uh, because of the federal subpoenas, they were able to uncover uh, that more than sixty million dollars was was funneled um, uh, this way uh, to influence the political system, and that's why we need to get this out uh, of our system uh, because uh, without the intervention of this money. Uh, in the manner in which it was funneled into political campaigns, um, this legislation would not have would not have happened. Uh, and what we do know is um, uh, a large number of those members that were elected because of this money are still in the General Assembly and still passing pro corporate laws, um, and and uh, um, influencing the political system. Uh, in ways that don't benefit the uh, average Ohioans, but only benefit the uh, large corporations and some of the utilities. And that continues to exist. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is um, while we are working in the move to amend the We the People Amendment, uh, there is another effort out there uh, to change the Constitution uh, and alter Citizen United. And that is funded by a political action committee called Wolfpack. And it is primarily funded by a gentleman uh, um, who uh, is employed by Google. And uh, this Wolfpack though, is taking a, a different uh, approach to amend the constitution than the move to amend uh, organization. And I'm very and deeply concerned 
uh, about the approach of Wolfpack because they are calling for an Article 5 convention uh, to change Citizen United and campaign finances. The problem is if we have an Article 5 convention, which is a constitutional convention, um, uh, we will not be able to control that convention. It will be runaway convention. And that convention will be dominated by the same corporate interests um, uh, that uh, have been already influencing the political system. Uh, so uh, those that support a constitutional convention, Republicans have supported it to balance the budget and this and that. First, they argue that uh, such an Article 5 convention could be controlled by uh, the resolutions passed by the various states. That is not the case because that's how the Articles of Confederacy were put aside uh, when uh, the, the Confederate states pulled together the convention. Um, um, they were there and, and driven by resolutions narrowly um, to address certain issues. But when the uh, convention uh, convened, they tossed out the entire articles and, and recreated our government. And that's the problem is we will not be able to control it once these conventioners are in place. In addition, um, the way these conventions are set up, it is, it is controlled. Uh, there are representatives, equal representatives from each of the states. So Montana gets the same number of delegates of, of what, six, 700,000 people as the state of California. And how is that representing the people across the United States? That, and, and we know through the electoral college system that that system is weighted heavily uh, towards um, um, uh, uh, a, a certain viewpoint. Uh, and it's not a, a viewpoint that is representative of all the, the people in the United States. So I have been working very strongly uh, against uh, the Wolf Pack articles um, uh, amending the Constitution through an Article 5 convention. And I will tell you that uh, as, as you folks talk to legislators, please distinguish your efforts uh, uh, to the, the Wolf Pack efforts because our legislators, whether in Cleveland or throughout the state, are getting confused by the two efforts. We don't want that Article 5 convention because it will be a runaway convention. We, and actually, uh, it, it could be written in our constitution that um, uh, corporations uh, would have a, a right to all the constitutional rights if, if that Article 5 convention goes through. We want a specific uh, uh, amendment to the, the constitution, the approach that uh, the move to amend uh, group has, has been utilizing. Um, so uh, I will leave it at that and I have it opened up for, for questions. Okay. Um... So I'm sure that people do have questions. Coordinating committee member, Mary Sue Minor is monitoring the chat. And um, so, and if you, as we said earlier, we can't find the raise your hand feature of Zoom, but just <laughs> raise your hand if you wish to speak. Or as Mary Sue mentioned earlier, you could just put the word stack in the chat and then we'll know to call on you. Um, so either Greg Colbridge or Mary Sue Minor will be calling on people with their questions. Also, if you have announcements of upcoming events, please direct them specifically to Sandy Bolsinius in the chat, and later on she'll read them out, okay? Thank you so much, uh, everybody, and, and our speakers were just terrific. Thank you, and now... We're open for questions. So we've, we've got two questions related to Alec. Um, Carla and Greg both put um, comments about Alec in the chat and directed to both Senator Antonio and Representative Skindo. How do we stop the dreadful corporate Alec bills preempting local home rule rights in the Ohio legislature? And the question, what is your sense of the influence of Alec, that is the American Legislative Exchange Council a pro-corporate front group in promoting state legislation. Senator Antonio, do you want to start off first? Oh, sure. To... I'll start. Um, so, Alec, uh, I, is um, in my in my book, Alec is synonymous with dangerous. 
um, and and powerful. Uh, they have been responsible for a number of uh, legislative movements across this country. Certainly, this is one of them. Um, and you know, again, there the things that come out of Alec go to the very heart of our democracy and and really unpacking it a little a little bit at a time. But they get to the root of where our democracy really is. Um, is rooted and entrenched and they try to start destroying at that level. And so things like going to um, home rule um, and individual, you know, community, community power and, um, and unpacking it there and, and really watering it down and taking it uh, local control away, all those things um, are really insidious. And they, <clears throat> they, they hit on a number of other fronts. Um, they're definitely um, going to work at, um, they've been behind a lot of the legislation that we see across states when it comes to attacks on specific communities, certainly the LGBTQ community, um, women's reproductive rights. Uh, the list just goes on and on in terms of they get model legislation and then they share it uh, across the country. And so um, when it comes to these core value issues of our democracy, I think it's the most dangerous because um, once they weaken those roots, then everything else is possible and their power builds for dismantling um, individual democracy. So that's my, my take on it. Representative? Yeah, so um, there's a... Uh... Understand that there are a, a number of legislative organizations, and there's a difference between ALEC and all the other uh, legislative organizations. All the other uh, legislative organizations, the ideas and the discussion originates from uh, the legislators themselves. Uh, uh, they bring it forward. Um, under and, and how those legislative organizations are funded uh, they are funded primarily from uh, uh, two uh, sources. They are funded, uh, one, uh, the states have a membership and they pay a membership fee to them. For example, the National Conference of State Legislators. Uh, in addition, uh, they will seek uh, nonprofit um, uh, sponsorships uh, on that. Uh, but um, uh, the boards and the committees and, and everything brought forward is run by the legislators. Alec, on the other hand, uh, we, the state of Ohio as other states that belong to it do pay a fee to it. However, pr Alec primarily is funded by for-profit corporations, gas and oil, utilities, uh, uh, big corporations. Um, their funding of those is not transparent. Uh, into that. In addition, they also serve on the boards and the committees. The corporations serve on the board and committees of, of ALEC. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, legislation and the discussion at ALEC is actually driven by the corporations. So it's the corporations that draft the legislation and bring it forward to the legislators and, and uh, push it among the states. And what they try to do is get certain states to start off with it. And unfortunately, Ohio, uh, over the last 15 years or so, maybe even longer, is one of the key states that they try uh, to start uh, this legislation in because it is so uh, Republican dominated. And uh, what's interesting is uh, one of the key persons and one of the key individuals who influences policy in the General Assembly is, is uh, now Representative Bill Seitz out of Cincinnati. And uh, he sits on the board of ALEC and he is one of the major drivers of policy uh, within uh, the state of Ohio, and it's all coming. And not only that is then uh, when they attend the ALEC meetings, uh, what happens is uh, uh, the corporations uh, uh, spend all this money on big dinners, big golf outings, big uh, drinks and receptions, and none of that is 
uh, disclosable uh, by the legislator, because there's a, a hole in our ethics law that says if if it's an organization, you're, you're, this is being paid by uh, a conference that the state pays membership into, uh, you don't have the reporting requirements that you do in other conferences. Uh, so I belong historically to uh, an, a legislative group called the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. Yes, the Joyce Foundation uh, provides, uh, 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 fun, had historically provided funding of the NCEL. Uh, However, uh, again, uh, it was uh, the legislative driven. The Joyce Foundation did not bring forward the legislation. It was all the Joyce Foundation did is they basically helped fund to make sure that we had a place to meet as legislators um, uh, and, and, and to help uh, defer cost of housing. Uh, what, uh, but it was the legislators that uh, came up and brought forward the legislation uh, uh, to be discussed um, uh, within that organization. So there's, there's a huge difference between uh, the setup and, and Alec has had a huge influence um, uh, in policy in the state. Uh, for example, these anti-protests, even uh, the one Senate Bill 33 that passed last session, that was Alec driven. Uh, the uh, uh, House Bill 6 was Alec driven. Uh, Anti-LGBTQ stuff has been Alec driven, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of policy across the state. Thank you both. Um, our next question comes from Bill Lyons. Do you believe that communities, cities and townships should be able to pass laws free from state preemption as long as their laws don't take away rights guaranteed to natural persons under the US and Ohio constitution? You know, I think that's a, that's a wonderfully worded question because of the fact that it that it um, in it, so thanks for that, um, that it talks about as long as it doesn't take away. Uh, because part of, part of the conversation in terms of some, some bills and some restrictions that are being suggested by some bills in the legislature right now um, take away preemption, but um, it's whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And, and that's the problem. Um, I, I come from municipal government originally, and I know how important it is for home rule um, to, be, to be upheld. We, we are a state that, that in, historically has prided itself on, on uh, supporting home rule. And I think um, because of the diversity of a state like Ohio, um, that it's, it's critical that our local communities are able to do that. So I absolutely um, am 100% in support. And as, um, as was outlined by the, by the questioner is, is the fact that it's critically important that, um, that, that preemption, you know, sometimes we pass bills in the state of Ohio to lift up, um, people all across the state. And when we're lifting up or when we're increasing their ability to, um, to have rights, that's a different story from when the state level legislation would actually preempt local governments and take away. That's, that's the critical part of this. And, and um, like our grandmas told us, the devil's in the details. Um, but those details are critical to maintaining uh, rights at the local level. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I, I support uh, local home rule. Um, it is um, uh, the municipal home rule provisions are in the Ohio Constitution. Um, and the problem is, is that uh, over the last 20 years on a whole variety of topics, uh, the Ohio Supreme Court, um, which has been supporting, um, again, has been funded by big corporate interests, um, has been knocking down those home rules. And it's uh, in a lot of areas. So for example, you saw the, uh, uh, the gas and oil preemption. So on uh, 
uh, that uh, there could not be uh, local ordinances that that deals with um, uh, uh, gas wells, oil wells, things like that. Um, and uh, the state uh, enacted preemption laws and the Supreme Court supported uh, those uh, preemption laws. Uh, the gun issue, uh, I, again, you saw um, um, states enacting gun laws, uh, and the local uh, municipalities acting uh, reasonable gun regulations and the state preempting them, the Supreme Court supporting that. Uh, the problem is, is that the Supreme Court has gutted uh, what existed in our uh, Ohio Constitution uh, to make uh, local uh, control basically meaningless. And it is something actually that I think um, uh, uh, folks should consider uh, revisiting in the, the Ohio Constitution, maybe strengthen it uh, to allow that. Uh, but the problem is to do that, you're gonna need a $20 million um, a campaign finance uh, because there will be a lot of corporate interest uh, opposing uh, that effort to change the Constitution. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Kathy Hazelton uh, to both Senator Antonio and Representative Skindle. Please share your thinking about the anti-protest bills in Ohio and what we can do about them. So we've talked a little bit about that, but if you want to expand on any of that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Representative, I'm gonna let you go first. Okay, thank you. So there are uh, four uh, bills, two in the House, two in the Senate, uh, that are classified uh, together as the anti-protest bills. Uh, this comes off of uh, Senate Bill 33, uh, enacted in the last General Assembly. Senate 33 um, uh, 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 stemmed from an ALEC initiative around the states uh, to enact anti-protest bills around uh, gas and oil uh, uh, pipelines, uh, the Keystone pipeline uh, issue and the protests surrounded around that. And so they started enacting this and they not only included gas and oil, but uh, they, they threw a whole bunch of things in what they call as critical infrastructure. And the problem is, is what they do is simple trespass laws, they turned into make major criminal uh, acts. Uh, and uh, it's extremely broad. Now, uh, they, they got that uh, type of legislation passed in a number of states. Now they're moving forward with other anti-protests stemming from um, uh, the various protests, uh, Black Lives Matters and others uh, last uh, year. Uh, and uh, so the, the concern is, is that these anti-protest bills are written broadly, increased and enhanced penalties. So uh, if uh, you're in uh, a group of people, first uh, um, they classify a riot. Um, uh, a riot is classified in Ohio as a, a gathering of four or more people that engage in disorderly conduct and understand disorderly conduct can be a whole variety of things from very simple things to more serious things. So just a gathering of four or more people. Uh, so if you're in a gathering of four or more people and you're, you're, you're holding signs, all of a sudden you're part of a, a riot. Uh, and if, you, uh, if any act occurs um, uh, or um, you distract police officers or law enforcement or EMTs, uh, you get enhanced penalties and can be thrown in jail for that. Uh, so for example, if you're, you're filming something and it's distracting the police that you're filming it, uh, you could be uh, uh, up for criminal conviction for that. If uh, you throw confetti and it distracts the police, you, you can be up uh, for uh, uh, a criminal violation, a felony uh, violation for that. If you um, you step, uh, if you're in a group of people that's protesting walking down a sidewalk and you step into the street, just because there's a lot of people, guess what? Uh, you're now blocking the street. You can be up for a criminal violation uh, for that. Um, uh, and they enhance the penalties from stuff that were minor misdemeanors. They now uh, create them into um, uh, uh, felonies. Um, so these are very dangerous laws. Um, there was a, a rally on Public Square uh, last Saturday, and in fact, uh, today, I think starting at two o'clock, and I think uh, 
uh, Senator Antonio, you actually may have a little bit more information at Ebenezer Church uh, this afternoon. There's a big uh, gathering of people uh, regarding uh, the anti-protest bills. Yeah. Um, see, I knew I knew it would be good for him to go first. <laughs> Thank you for laying that out so, in such great detail. Um, at the end of the day, I, the bottom line is, you know, um, we have heard as long as I've been in the legislature how important Second Amendment rights are, uh, the right to bear arms, to have guns, and and we've gone through. We've gone through a whole lot of legislation and conversation and debate, um, but always leaning on the side of, of some an extreme, as far as I'm concerned, uh, right of not just gun owners, but of guns themselves to be everywhere. Um, and so I find it so interesting and again, ironic that this is the same legislature that would now curb First Amendment rights. And so I think what's critically important is that we have to ferociously defend First Amendment rights, the right to free speech, the right to gather and assemble and to petition our government when they're not doing what we want or to let them know that, that we should have the same enthusiasm um, it won't be funneled by the same lobbyists and, and, and money behind it, but hopefully the power of the people to say, absolutely not, you cannot take this right away from us. This is, this is the, the, again, it's the foundational, um, it's one of the foundational cores of our democracy. And I, I am so shocked, frankly, that that at this point in time, that this would be something that in a democracy, any group of, of policymakers thinks is a good idea. Um, and I guess I shouldn't be shocked, um, but still, and, and, and maybe it's a good thing that I'm shocked because to me, it's very clear um, how much our democracy depends on our ability to be able to voice um, and to witness when, when government is, is holding the people in a way that's not democratic with a small d. So, so I think it's critical. Um, certainly, I know one of the questions, what can we do about it? I think it's very, very important that people uh, voice their displeasure at these efforts to take away our, our ability to free speech. Um, and, and that at every turn, um, we have to push back on this. Um, of course, it's a response to a lot of the other issues that are going on right now in local communities, but in general, we don't have to look very far um, to see um, what happens when, when violence is not abated. Um, we look at the insurgency that happened at the Capitol on January 6th, and so I, I just think that um, you need to, everyone needs to communicate with their own representatives. And if that happens to be either Representative Skindell or myself, um, you can let us know that you support. And some of you have, I've heard from some of you already for sure um, about your, you know, your shock also with um, any kind of an effort to take away your voice. Um, and I also think it, um, folks need to reach out to the chairs of the committees these bills are in. Um, I will work with my staff uh, to make sure that next week we can uh, gather that information of where the, what the committee, what the numbers are, where the committees are. We can share it with Greg um, and, and you all so that then you have that information for both the House and the Senate. And um, and then let the chairs of the committee know and the sponsors of the bill know that you do not. You live in the state of Ohio. See, representative government is very interesting because while a lot of times you're directed to your specific representative, the people you put in office, absolutely. But know that when Representative Skandal or I vote on a bill or vote no on a bill, we're voting on behalf of the entire state of Ohio because when the bill goes into effect or gets stopped, the entire state of Ohio is affected 
by that. And so um, you have a right to reach out to those folks who would take away your voice and say, no, not in my state. Don't do this in my state. Um, and so we'll, we'll share that information with you next week, but phone calls, letters, um, emails, if they're personal emails, I think are, are very effective at at least, you know, getting the message across that um, we do not embrace this, this at all. Thanks. Let me uh, just uh, add, so there is a town hall meeting. Oh, on these I'm sorry. Yeah, today. Go ahead. I have yeah. that information. Good. Thanks. It is from two o'clock to four o'clock this afternoon at the Second Ebenezer Baptist Church, located at 1881 East 71st Street in Cleveland. That's 1881 East 71st Street in Cleveland, and that's from two to four. Thank you. Um, one other comment <clears throat> on this topic that's in the chat. Uh, Dave Lima points out that opposition testimony will be held Thursday at 2 p.m. on House Bill 22, Obstruction of Justice. So just in case you missed Great. that. Um, we're touching on a lot of different topics and clearly um, we're hungry for legislative discussion and there are a lot of, a lot of concerns. Um, another one from, from Ron, what's going to happen with redistricting in Ohio? I thought the voters had passed a reform that would make redistricting a nonpartisan process. Could you update us on that, please? Okay, so, um, so we voted on a, a better process than what we have now, um, but it's still a majority led process. Um, and we have high hopes for re redistricting, but remember that redistricting is based on the census numbers. And if you've been following uh, the news on the census numbers, you know that there's a, there's, there's a scramble right now. Um, and I don't, uh, I'll start by saying I don't declare myself an expert in this area, but from what I've been paying attention to and how we've been trying to monitor the situation, um, there's so many unknowns. We don't know if they're going to use what census data was collected. There's talk at the federal level because the census was stopped early and then restarted. There were all kinds of issues from the past administration about even resources to gather the census to begin with. Um, what kinds of questions? I mean, there's a, there's a myriad of questions over how when all said and done, how valid is the data we have? What data do we have? because it went on longer because of the pandemic and other reasons. So right off the bat, um, there's questions around the census data. Once we get past the census data, whether they're gonna use the current data, last time's data, are they gonna um, use some kind of a formula to update? Um, but once we get past that and we have the census data, then there's, a, there's still a clock ticking for the end of this year to be able to redraw the lines if that's what's gonna happen. I'm starting to hear murmurings that perhaps uh, what could happen is we would use the same lines this time around and because of the reforms that were passed we would go four years instead of 10 years and come back in four years and try to do this when there's supposedly better data. Um, so I don't know if that's a possibility. I do know that there are efforts at work um, you know, across a fair, fair, fair districts, Ohio is a group trying to do some modeling of what fair districts would look like. My hope is we'll be able to present some of those model uh, maps to folks in the fall and say, here's a map that is fair, that would work for Ohio. Because when all is said and done, Ohio, Ohio is certainly a swing, has always been a swing state. Um, and that it really does go back and forth. Um, for the most part, Ohio is a third clear, clear Democrat, a third clear Republican, and then a third that moves and swings. And all we have to do is look at the vote counts from the past and look at Sherrod Brown's um, vote counts to see what happens when someone appeals 
to folks across party lines. When we look at um, President Obama's numbers in, in some of the past elections, and then we fast forward and look at Joe Biden's numbers this past time um, in Ohio, and we know that, um, that 45 had um, a 10 point lead in the state of Ohio still as he went into the election with, um, with President Biden. But um, those numbers are skewed when you look at the numbers for Sherrod Brown. So what it tells us is that people um, don't necessarily put themselves in these boxes. But what it also tells us when we look at the map is that a large part of the state of the people in the state of Ohio are not represented, especially when it comes to their congressional districts. Um, when you look at a map that shows you the the four little tiny blue areas and a sea a sea of red, what we know is that when people are given on their own uh, to vote, they vote um, back to a third, a third, and a third, and move around. Um, the Senate districts, the House districts are, are gerrymandered in a way that is not reflective of that either. Um, and so our, my hope is that we move toward more fair, uh, draw a, a more fair map. Um, I'm not sure, uh, there's so, many un, so much uncertainty in this process this time. I'm, I'm hoping we get some clarity by the fall and representative, I don't know, I'm sure uh, you have some thoughts on this too. Uh, yes, uh, first, um, uh, before I talk about the um, redistricting, I just uh, posted a link to the anti-protest toolkit. Uh, so there's a link there, you can go to that toolkit and it gives you a lot of resources about the various bill numbers, uh, things like that that are pending in the General Assembly. Uh, so that toolkit is there. Uh, uh, Senator Antonio covered most everything that uh, can be said about the redistricting. Um, so although the uh, 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 changes that uh, the Ohioans voted to approve uh, tried to improve the system, uh, again, it is a majority led system. It's a not a nonpartisan commission like uh, a number of uh, other states have like California. Uh, and it, it does pose a problem. Uh, Republicans, of course, would like to keep the current lines in place because it keeps their dominance in the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that there will be uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, to what they, they do. Uh, it, 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 uh, you know, uh, and Republicans are trying to do every effort uh, to mess up the census data and delay or, or cause problems with the uh, census data uh, that they possibly can, including our own state attorney general. Thank you. Uh, there have been additional comments um, put in the chat. Uh, the Ohio Community Rights Network has two proposed state constitutional amendments to allow local self-government free from state preemption. Mm -hmm. And there's a link to that um, with special attention um, asked by Senator Antonio and Representative Skindle to, to take a look at that and uh, consider introducing them. And then um, there was a, excuse me, there, there were uh, Justin uh, Fiorell from, the, um, from Wolfpack is with us today. And he added some comments about um, a constitutional convention and what that might what that might mean and some, some resources for that for anyone who wants to um, explore those questions a little more. And um, we've got, I think, well, maybe the final question, um, well, or two. Uh, Sandy asks if, we, if there are other allies in the Ohio Assembly. Uh, she's thinking of uh, Senator Craig, uh, Representative Boggs possibly, and others. And then um, how can we most assist your efforts in the Ohio Assembly? So I, I think that's probably probably the most important question <laughs> that we've, we've gotten. Um, and Fair Districts Ohio, Senator, you wanna mention that as well, that's fine too. So if you could just talk about um, what we need to do next to help you and who else we need to talk to to help you.
Senator, are you taking that up or you want me to start? Why don't you start? I got to plug in my computer before it dies. <laughs> okay. um, uh, first, uh, uh, before addressing those things. Uh, so Justin from Wolfpack is on here. So the one thing I, I want to say, and, and I, I maybe I should have clarified it a little bit earlier. I think that the, the folks behind Wolfpack, uh, uh, the people that are working on that issue, they're, they're well-intentioned and they're good people and, and they have the same goal. And I've had discussions with Wolfpack about this. They have the same goal about uh, ending um, uh, corporate financing in our political system. Uh, the, the difference is the uh, Constitutional Convention and uh, Wolfpack and the folks around uh, Wolfpack know um, that I'm strongly against the Constitutional Convention. Over the years in the General Assembly uh, and the committees that I have been on, I've literally sat probably through 20 plus hours of testimony about the pros and cons of the Constitutional Convention. And what we do know is that one, it's gonna be controlled by Republicans, uh, Republican states because uh, uh, the way this is set up. And two, uh, uh, there, nothing can limit uh, what happens um, uh, when the conventioners meet. Uh, and then you have the process of the states uh, approving that as to whether that can occur. Uh, and my, my belief is the better way uh, is to go through uh, uh, the normal uh, constitution amending of our constitution as opposed to the, the convention. Um, the best way that you can help us, so first on the uh, move to amend, is try to reach out to legislators uh, either through email or a telephone call. And, and we're talking about even uh, local legislators. So um, uh, your, your own local legislators uh, or uh, throughout the state. So first reach out to, to the ones that represent you, your, your state senator or your, um, your uh, uh, state representative. Uh, and uh, then if you do have a connection with uh, any legislators out that, outside of that, make sure you reach out to them. And uh, even though that you feel that uh, they are supportive of your issue, it's still important to reach out to them uh, and, and to let them know uh, your viewpoints. Uh, that's the, one of the biggest things. And I think uh, Senator Antonio can take it from there. Thanks, yeah, and I, I totally agree. I Sometimes people think um, they forget about the fact that um, both at our level, at the state level, but also at the federal level, when you agree with what a legislator is doing or you want them to continue down the path, it's good for you to also communicate with them um, so that they get a balanced uh, communication from the people. You don't want any of us just hearing about um, when you disagree. Uh, it's good to hear about and have your support for us to be able to say, and I've heard from my constituents, this is what they want. They want this change. Uh, that helps us. That helps us as we, as we discuss and debate these issues. Um, absolutely, the local level, I mean, I, uh, as you can tell, uh, Representative Skindel and I work well together. Um, we, we work in, in concert with each other on a lot of these kinds of issues. Um, and so I think that's critically important. I did put, I'm not good at putting things in the chat as you can see, but I did put the fair dis, fairohiodistricts.com um, or .org. I think I got it right the second time. So just look at the second one um, and you can go to their website and get involved in the fair districts if that's something that's important to you as it should be important to all of us. Um, but you can get more information there from them. Um, I, you know, ultimately, it is, it is, uh, there's a lot to go around, um, but to, to come back to our, uh, the, the core basis for the gathering here today, if we uh, don't push back and fight back on Citizens United. And I do agree with Representative Skindel, as well as um, the only way to really amend our constitution is through, is through uh, a legislative or process um, or a process of the people. Um, I do not, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of people that have everything to lose by opening up the entire constitution and as, as at this point in time, I think that's very dangerous. I do appreciate also, you know, the work of folks like Wolfpack and some of the others who are bringing um, these issues and helping to educate folks. But I think it's also incumbent on all of us and important to us. Um, we may differ on how we get there. And um, so the how we get to the resolution is a little different. 
Um, but um, these issues, it's important. Um, at the core, you all are defending democracy, something that um, is, is fundamental to people living in a free society. And if we're gonna keep our society free, um, and there really is the ability to have um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone, not just for some people, um, then the work that we do on uh, really ending Citizens United in, in the long run, I think is the best thing, the best way forward to get that, um, that corporate money out of our decision-making and really allow for people to choose their politicians and their their representatives not for the politicians to choose the people and i think at the end of the day that's probably the most important thing so i just want to thank you all uh, for your work it's been a long grueling time uh, that you've been at this as um, representative skindell pointed out it's been um, over 10 years and I just really appreciate your work. And um, it's good to be with you. It's, it's everybody wants the conversation and, and um, it's been a great conversation for me as well. I enjoy your thoughtfulness. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna ask Sandy Bolsinius if she has received any um, announcements directed to her in the chat that she wants to read out to us at this point. Yes, I have four and I will um, and I won't give you the links because they'll be in the um, email that we send afterwards, although I may um, post them in the chat so you have them. Um, but the first one is uh, Move to Men Central Ohio. That's the group I'm with. Uh, we have a session on qualified immunity next Thursday, at April 22nd from seven to eight. And it's um, we are inviting Cynthia Brown, the founder of Deescalate Now, to talk about qualified immunity. Um, the next one is the We the People Miami County presents Perspectives on Democracy, a virtual conversation about corporate power and big money in politics. That's May, Wednesday, May 12th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. And um, I, will, I will post this link. And um, this event coincides with, this is very important, it coincides with the 135th anniversary of the May 10th, 1886 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad. If you're a move to men person, you know exactly what that's about. If not, join, find, find out. Um, this is also a really cool one because it's going to be about local dialogue in Troy. Oftentimes we get the big cities involved, but, um, but this is more of a, um, of a rural area. And um, the other one is the Ohio Community Rights Network, OHCRN, um, has a democracy film series. These are really great. The next one is Sunday, April 25th, so coming up at 2 p.m. And it's Invisible Hand. Lots of local Ohioans in this one. And, um, and then the, the, on Sunday, August 29th at 2 p.m., there's another movie you will not want to miss. I've seen it, it's phenomenal. It's The New Corporation. Um, and all the films feature a Q&A discussion at the end with Ohioans that many of you know, um, such as Marky e. Miller, Tish O'Dell, and our own Greg Coleridge, who happens to be on this, on this um, you know, here today. And the last thing I wanna say is to stay tuned for our next Move to Men statewide gathering this fall. We still need to finalize that, but um, it's gonna be a doozy. So you won't want to miss that one. And that's all I have. I'll start posting some of these individually in the chat, but they will be in the follow-up email. Thanks all. So with, with that, um, I think we may be drawing to a close here unless our guests have any final words for us. I think uh, Senator Antonio sort of said um, said goodbye to us, but she's still hanging in. And I don't know if Representative Skindel has anything additional that he would like to say. I just uh, thank you for uh, everybody that uh, put this together. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for uh, the work of Move to Amend uh, in going forward and be working with you as we uh, bring forward the uh, 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 House and Senate resolutions here shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.
Um, I'm still here posting if anyone's going to stay on. <laughs> well, so we, we won't save the chat until after you've posted everything. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, I was waiting too, so feel free. <laughs> I'm, yeah. actively, I'm actively copying what you're putting in the chat, so I'll have access. You know what, Bob, I can just, it might be easier for you if I just send it to you in a text. Well, Bob, if you look on if you look on your chat where you enter, you should see three dots to the right. And if you hover over those, it says more. And if you click on that, you'll see something that says save chat. Can you find it? Well, you can do that, but it's easier if I just send it to you an email. It, it's changing every few seconds, so I don't want to yeah. skip it now. Yeah, you have to wait until it's done. <laughs> wait till she's I'm just done. cutting and pasting easily. Okay. What, what Sandy's typing. Just so That's you're it. aware of it. I just I just did the three because we 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 have not organized the final one yet. Was that it? Just Sandy? three. Mm -hmm. Bye everybody. Great, great seeing everybody. Really good call. Wonderful call. See ya. Bye bye. Oh, Jamie, I didn't know you were here. I just saw your, 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 your name and not your face. You got everything you need, Bob? I think so. I was on one Zoom call where I was unable to cut and paste the chat from what I saw on my screen. I had to use character recognition instead. It just prohibited me from highlighting and cutting and pasting. Or That's copying, weird. I should say, literally. Wonder why. A different, a completely different chat, but it was frustrating on that, that event. Yeah, I like that poster behind you, too. Yeah, I may try to figure out how to do that. Okay, well, be well. See you.